Metabolite is basically any substance, any chemical substance in your body that your body either builds or breaks down. That's a metabolite. Glucose is a metabolite. Proteins are metabolites. A nutrient is basically stuff that you eat, metabolites that you eat. When we eat food, there's proteins and fats and carbohydrates. Those are nutrients. So when you're eating food, you're eating nutrients, you're eating metabolites, things that your body can either break down or put together to make other stuff. Now, there's basically two types of chemical substances we're going to talk about. Most of the substances in your body, the proteins, the lipids, the nucleic acid, all these big molecules, these are called organic molecules. Organic means that they are mainly made up of carbon and hydrogen atoms with a few other atoms thrown in for fun. DNA. Carbon and hydrogen. Lots of carbon and hydrogen. A little nitrogen, a little phosphorus thrown in there. But lots of carbon and hydrogen. Inorganic molecules, they can have carbon, they can have hydrogen, but that's not the main component. Inorganic molecules tend to be very small molecules. Carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, sodium chloride. Those are inorganic substances. Now, we've already talked about water. We said water was kind of a cool molecule because it had those polar covalent bonds. One side of the molecule, the oxygen side, is a little bit negative because it hogged the electrons. We talked about surface tension, why, why belly flops hurt. So water has some unique properties, and a lot of these properties are based on the fact that the water molecule is polar. There's a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side. Water makes a great lubricant. Have you ever had high heel shoes on? It was raining, and you stepped on a piece of tile, and your foot fell out. I mean, yeah. Or the glass that sweats and it slides. Water also has a high heat capacity. Now, what the heck does that mean? How many of y'all boil water? It takes a while, doesn't it? The reason it takes so long for the water to boil is that that water in that liquid state it is absorbing heat and absorbing heat and absorbing heat. And it takes a while before that water starts to be converted to steam. That's what I mean by high heat capacity. Water can absorb and retain heat. The reason that the water can absorb all of that heat is because in order to get it from the liquid state into the gas state, water vapor, steam, you've got to break all those hydrogen bonds. Even though each, each little hydrogen bond is weak, together they're strong. So water has a high heat capacity. Water is very reactive. That polar nature of the water molecule makes it a very reactive substance. We've already talked about condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions, right? Where water can be used in a hydrolysis reaction to actually split a molecule apart. You can put two molecules together and get a water molecule out of it. One of the coolest things about water is it is sometimes water is called the universal solvent. Water will not dissolve everything, so it's not really the universal solvent. Like oil and vinegar dressing, right? Vinegar is water, it, you know, the oil doesn't dissolve in there. But water does dissolve a lot of things. So we say water has, is a good solvent. A solvent is the stuff that's doing the dissolving. The stuff that is being dissolved is the solute. And if you put the solvent, if you put the solute into the solvent, you have a solution. Any solution that uses water as the solvent is called an aqueous solution. In other words, all, basically our bodies, our cells, are just big bags of aqueous solution. We have water inside of our cells, and we have lots of stuff dissolved in that water. So our cytoplasm, our intracellular fluid, is an aqueous solution. We also have water outside of our cells. We've got lots of stuff dissolved in that. Our extracellular fluid is an aqueous solution. So all the chemical reactions that are happening inside of our cells are happening, happening in an aqueous solution. Anything that is hydrophilic likes water. Hydrophilic. These are things that either absorb water or can't dissolve in water. They're called water-soluble. Any ionic compound, anything that's joined together with ionic bonds. Remember we said, I said that an ionic bond was strong as long as it was in a dry condition? But if you put salt in water, it comes apart. It dissolves. 
ionic bonds can be broken by water molecules. So any kind of ionic compound can dissolve in water. Any molecule that is polar, glucose, glucose is a molecule. The atoms don't fall apart. They're, they're joined by covalent bonds. But glucose will dissolve in water because some of those bonds are polar covalent bonds. So ionic molecules and polar molecules are water-soluble or hydrophilic. They will dissolve in water. Now, what's really cool is if you take a salt crystal, this represents a, a salt crystal, sodium ions and chloride ions, sodium ions and chloride ions. Sodium ions are positively charged, right? They gave up one of their electrons. The chloride ions are negatively charged. Well, here you've got this little crystal, this little block of all these ions put together, and water molecules start to literally attack that crystal. And what happens is the negative side, the oxygen side of the water molecule, is slightly negative. It's attracted to the sodium ions. And so you get water molecules that surround the sodium ions by the negative sides. The water molecules surround the chloride the other way. Chloride is negative, and so the hydrogen sides surround the chloride ions. And so you get what's called a sphere of hydration around each of those ions, or a hydration sphere. And so one ion at a time, water takes one ion at a time off of that crystal of salt, and it eventually dissolves. Now, if you've got a big molecule of glucose, Remember that these oxygen-hydrogen bonds, just like the oxygen-hydrogen bonds in water, these oxygen-hydrogen bonds in glucose, these are polar covalent bonds. So the whole molecule of glucose has some little pluses and some little minuses. And if a whole, it, it can be like a great big giant molecule, but if it's got pluses and minuses on its surface, it's going to attract water molecules. And so if you've got one molecule of glucose, it's going to be surrounded by a whole bunch of water molecules. And so it, quote, dissolves in the water. So that's hydrophilic substances. Hydrophobic substances are not soluble in water. They repel water. If you mix oil and vinegar, vinegar is an aqueous solution. It's acetic acid, basically. You can shake it up, you can suspend those oil droplets, but eventually those oil droplets actually will go back together. The oil will literally attract itself and squeeze out all of the water molecules. And so you end up with a layer of oil and a layer of water. You wax your car, so the wax is on the paint, and it repels the water away from the paint. Now, if we're big bags of water, why don't we dissolve when we get in the bathtub? Remember we said we had intracellular fluid? It was water, basically, and extracellular fluid? The cell membrane is made out of lipids. So you won't, your cells won't dissolve in water because the membrane of the cell is made out of lipid. Blood, the fluid that is flowing through your blood vessels, it is a special type of solution. It is called a colloid. The actual liquid portion of the blood is called plasma. You've got the blood cells, the red cells and the white cells and the platelets hanging out in there. But if you just took the plasma itself, it is an aqueous solution. It's mostly water. It's like 90-something percent water. But there are a lot of large molecules, large proteins. There's lots and lots of protein floating around your bloodstream. Proteins are very large molecules. They can have hundreds of thousands of atoms in them. So a solution that has a bunch of these large molecules that stay in solution, if you let the plasma sit there, if you take it away from the cells, if you let the whole blood sit there, the cells will settle out. But if you take just the liquid portion of the plasma and let it sit, it's, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to settle out of it. A suspension, the whole blood itself is a suspension because the cells will settle out of solution. We talked about all the cool stuff about water. Water, water is really good at dissolving things, and it's a good lubricant, and it has those hydrogen bonds, and it makes it do some weird things like surface tension. I mean, those, these are polar covalent bonds, right? Those oxygen hog, hogs with those electrons. Now, every once in a while, one of these hydrogens just gets really PO. One out of every about 10 million water molecules, one of the hydrogens says, you can have an electron. I'm taking my proton. <coughs> So we say that water dissociates, it falls apart. It doesn't happen very often. But one out of about 10 million does this. The only thing that's left is water. 
The proton. Yeah. So a lot of times the word proton and the words hydrogen ion are used interchangeably. Because a hydrogen atom is basically a proton and electron. And if it leaves its electron behind, the only thing you've got left is a proton. So, when a water molecule dissociates, you end up with a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. pH has to do with this hydrogen ion, this proton that's hanging out by itself. This is not a happy camper. It wanted two electrons, now it has none. This hydrogen ion, this proton, it goes around bugging other people bugging other chemicals, trying to get its electron back. And so it's very disruptive. And so we have this concept, what we call pH, that deals with how many of these suckers are floating around. pH is defined as the negative, and that's the important part, the negative law of the hydrogen ion concentration. If pH is high, that means this is low. If pH is low, you got a whole bunch of that's what that negative sign does. It makes it a, an opposite relationship. Now, in general, the pH ranges from 0 to 14. There are some negative pHs, but we don't have to worry about those. As far as physiologically important pH is from 0 to 14. Neutral pH, a pH of 7 is neutral. So pure water has a pH of 7. That's what we call neutral. Anything less than 7 is acidic. Anything greater than 7 is basic or alkaline. So neutral pH is a pH of 7. Anything less than 7 is acidic. Anything greater than 7 is basic. Your stomach acid has a pH of about 1. The oven cleaner that you spray to get all that crap that you bake on for three and a half years in the oven has a pH of about 12, 13, something like that. If hydrogen ion concentration goes up, that means pH goes down. down. So if hydrogen ion concentration goes down, pH goes up. Okay, so that's what I mean by that, by that inverse relationship. So the more acidic something is, the blank the pH. Lower. Lower. More basic means higher pH. We said that water was neutral, right? So neutral pH is pH of 7. What that means is, at a pH of 7, the number of hydrogen ions equals the number of hydroxide ions. If you think about pure water, you've got a vapor of water, every once in a while one of those molecules will dissociate and give you a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. And so they balance out pH of 7. If the pH is less than 7, that means you have more hydrogens than you do hydroxides. If the pH is greater than 7, that means you have more hydroxides than you do hydrogens. Blood is just a little bit basic. A little bit out. In fact, here's a number I want you to remember. Normal blood pH is 7.35 7.45. If it gets out of this range, you die. Now, that's a pretty narrow range. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's how important pH is. pH is tightly controlled in your body. And it won't be until we get to the end of ANP2 that you'll understand completely how the body controls pH. Now, your normal blood sugar, a fasting blood glucose level, it's somewhere, depending on what textbook you read, about 65 to 110, 120, something like that. That's a much wider, a much broader range. And you think, well, that'd be important to control, right? And it is, but it's not nearly as important to control as pH. All right, so anything that is acidic, is an acid, is something that increases the number of protons, increases the number of hydrogen ions present, and therefore lower the pH. Anything that's basic does the opposite. Bases decrease the number of hydrogen ions and therefore raise the pH. So, if you go you hydrochloric acid, the kind that's made in your stomach or the kind that's sitting over in the chemistry lab, when you take hydrochloric acid and you dissolve it in water, it dissociates. I 
quark acid is an ionic compound. Remember, we, we, we um, dissolve ionic compounds like sodium chloride. If we dissolve them in water, they dissociate, right? The ions pop apart. So that's the same thing that happens with this. And of course, when this dissociates, you get a whole bunch of these. And that's why it's called hydrochloric acid. If this stayed attached to this, like this, it would have no effect whatsoever on the age. If this didn't dissociate, if it stayed together, it wouldn't affect the age. Only when these are hanging out by themselves do they have an effect on the age. It's the naked protons, basically. Now, sodium hydroxide, that's a very common base. That's basically what's in the oven cleaner. Sodium hydroxide, sometimes they put potassium hydroxide in there. Nasty stuff. It also dissociates. You put it in water, and the sodium ion pops off, and the hydroxide ion pops off. So if you've got a beaker of water and you put sodium hydroxide in it, you're going to have more of these, and so it's going to be a basic. It's going to be the pH is going to go up. What happens is when you dissolve this in water, remember that water dissociates by itself. And so when you put this in water and it falls apart, this tends to bind up any of these that are present and make water. And so it's taking these out of solution. And that's why the pH goes up. Because these are no longer by themselves. They're missing. They're taken out of solution. That's how bases work. Bases release hydroxide ions. And then the hydroxide ions go out and hook up with a hydrogen ion in the water. And so if you, anything that takes these out of solution, anything that takes protons, hydrogen ions out of solution, raises the pH. And we call that a base. Anything that puts more of these in solution, <clears throat> anything that increases the hydrogen ion concentration, lowers the pH. We call those acids. The more hydrogen the ions I have, the lower the pH, right? Well, another concept here that's kind of weird. You can have strong acids and weak acids. You can have strong bases and weak bases. A strong acid or a strong base, when you put them in water, like sodium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid, when you put them in water, they completely dissociate. So you think, well, that, wouldn't that be weak? Will they fall apart? The strong refers to the fact on how they affect the pH. Strong acids and strong bases have a strong effect, a large effect on pH, because they completely dissociate. You put hydrochloric acid, almost, you know, 99.9% .9 of all those hydrochloric acid compounds fall apart to release lots of hydrogen ions. If you put sodium, I started to say sodium chloride, you put sodium hydroxide, you can actually get a little sodium hydroxide pellet to dissolve those in water. They completely dissociate so that you have a bunch of sodium ions and a bunch of hydroxide ions. Strong acids and strong bases completely break apart in water. Weak acids and weak bases don't completely break apart. In your body, the most common weak acid that we have is something called carbonic acid. I talked about that a little bit last week. If I had 10 of these and I put it in water, put it in water, I might only get two of those and two of those. I still have eight of these left. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. It does not, all of it does not completely dissociate. And in fact, this is one of those examples of that equilibrium or reversible reactions. So if I had 10 of these and I put it in water, when it got, when it reached equilibrium, when it got finished falling apart, I might end up with eight of these left and two of those and two of those. If it were a strong acid, I would have none of these left, and I'd have 10 of these. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. If you put carbonic acid in water, it doesn't change the pH very much, because most of it stays intact. Most of it doesn't dissociate, only a little bit does. And that's a good thing, because we make a lot of carbonic acid. You know how we make carbonic acid? Anytime we break down food, anytime we break down glucose, glucose, C6, H12, O6, carbons and hydrogens and oxygen, right? When our cells completely break that down to make ATP, we convert that carbon dioxide in water. You take carbon dioxide and you put it in water, you get carbonic acid. Now, if carbonic acid was a strong acid, we'd screw up each other. 
But it's a weak acid. So our body has mechanisms to deal with that. Your body is constantly making acids. Anytime, if, if your cells are alive, they're making energy, they're producing acids. Now, what's our weak pH? 7.35. There you go. So our blood is actually a little bit what? Basic. Why? So we can neutralize the acids that are constantly being made. Hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, these are strong, strong acid, strong base. Carbonic acid, the one that's up here, and ammonia. Ammonia is a weak piece. Ammonia hangs out just fine, but if there's any extra hydrogens in the water, it'll suck them up. It forms what they call the ammonium ion. And so this functions as a base by sucking up extra leaves. Isn't that cool? Anything that removes these out of solution is a base, right? Because if you take these out of solution, if you bind them, if you suck them up, the fewer of these you have, the higher the pH goes. I said that our blood is a little bit basic, so we can deal with this acid that, that our cells are constantly producing. What we have inside of our body to help deal with this are called buffers. A buffer is anything that resists a change in pH. So you have buffer systems in your body that help deal with the acids that were constantly being produced. The way buffers, in fact, one of the most common buffer systems in the body is what we call the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. That's what this is. And it's this ability to go both ways, this ability for this reaction to be reversible that allows a buffer system to work. So the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, that's the most common buffer system. There's a couple other minor ones, but this is the big one. If hydrogen ions increase, so if your cells are really breaking down a lot of glucose and they're producing a lot of hydrogen ions, what happens is the bicarbonate ion combines with those hydrogen ions to produce carbonic acid. The bicarbonate neutralizes. It binds to, it combines with the hydrogen ions to make carbonic acid. And as long as the carbonic acid stays together, it has no effect on pH. Now, if you start throwing up, get sick, and you start throwing up a lot of hydrochloric acid, you're actually getting rid of hydrogen ions, right? You can actually cause your blood pH to go up because you're spewing out hydrogen. So, in that case, if the hydrogen ions in your blood starts to drop, they start to drop, then this falls apart and replaces them. So, buffer systems work by being able to respond to both an increase in hydrogen ions or a decrease in hydrogen ions. They're able to compensate for changes in hydrogen ion concentrations. They're able to resist or compensate for anything that would change the pH. So, basically, by changing the amount of hydrogen ions, you're changing the equilibrium of this reaction. You got too many of these, the reaction goes that way. You don't have enough of these, the reaction goes that way. Now, I said your blood goes 7.35 to 7.45, right? It's a little bit basic. You know why? Your kidneys are set up to keep a little bit of extra bicarbonate. That's why your blood is a little bit basic, because there's a little extra bicarbonate floating around right there. That's one of the jobs of the kidneys. They're set up, they function in order to save a little extra bicarbonate so that your blood pH is a little bit basic, so it's able to neutralize the acids that you normally produce. Any pH of the blood that drops below this, we, we say that the person is in acidosis. Any pH above 7.45, the person is in alkalosis. These are all symptoms of acidosis. Now, that's not the only thing that causes acidosis, but that's the most common cause of acidosis. It's, it's uncontrolled diabetes, diabetic ketoacidosis. All right, we've already talked about sodium chloride. We said sodium chloride was a salt. Well, a table salt, right? What is a table salt? A sodium chloride is an ion compound that doesn't have this as the cation and this is the anion. So, in general, there are some exceptions, but in general, when you put a salt in water, it doesn't affect the pH. So we're talking about sodium chloride, potassium chloride is a very common salt in the body, sodium bicarbonate, magnesium chloride, calcium phosphate, these are things that you're going to find in your bones. Now, why are we worried about salts? I remember, I 
I was talking about, talking about the kidneys. I said the kidneys are important in uh, maintaining water balance and sodium balance. Well, that leads to something called electrolytes. An ionic compound, when it dissolves in water, it dissociates, just like acids and bases. And so you get sodium ions and chloride ions. And once you have those charged particles dissolved in water, the water will conduct electricity. Pure water doesn't conduct electricity. Now, why is this important? The way your nerve cells, your neurons, and your muscle cells, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, those cells are dependent on electrolyte balance for order to function, in order to function correct. 